Um, Paul Samuelson, that's who I am, chair for MKP USA. You're going to hear um, for a minute, uh, just a little bit from Ed and Brian, who are also part of the chair team. Um, and we're, as usual, very excited that you're here and that we can present to you this program uh, with James Nolan. Um, I think that what's important for me to share is we put these together and have them scheduled for the, for the full year that we have in an effort to get more connected and stay more connected in these times when it's more difficult to be connected. It's also an opportunity for us to share with you some different pieces that might help all of us as we walk through these times we're in right now. So our intention is to be able to spend time to get together more, be more connected, and also learn and grow together in these moments. So thanks for taking the time to be here out of your day and out of your life uh, and spend with us. It does my heart so much good to be in the company of all of these, all of us um, in, these, in these interesting and challenging times. So thank you again for coming. I'm gonna turn it first uh, over to Ed to, to bring us into the call. Uh, and so Ed, would you please take that? He's the immediate past chair uh, and part of this chair team that puts this together. So Ed, please. Thanks, Paul. Brothers, put your feet on the floor. Feel the floor under your feet. I'm speaking to you from land that belongs to the uh, Washoe tribe, the Paiute tribe. Think about who was on the land before you were, before we were. And honor the land and the those who were the stewards of the land long before we came. Take a breath. And let's have tonight be useful and engaging and enlightening for us all. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. I'd like to introduce you now to um, Brian Harrell. Brian, is the, excuse uh, me a second, Paul. I, I just got called on a, a rookie error, mistake I shouldn't have made. The brothers and sisters. Thank you. Yeah, Go. I'll take that a step further. Um, welcome, Eleanor, to our circle and being with us. It really makes me feel great that you're here, and I'm happy that you're a part of us. Uh, so thank you for your energy and your spirit and being here with us. And there's one more of us on here. I'm not the only one. I didn't. Okay. I want to make sure I recognize her if I can find her. There you are. He, he is that it? Yes. Yeah. Well, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, Eleanor invited me and so here I am. Yeah, well, thank you both for being here. And uh, you're always welcome in these circles, uh, the chairs, front porch circles. It's welcome, welcome to be here. So oh, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize we would be such a minority. Well, <laughs> no. we'll have to grow that. We'll have to grow that in. So thanks, thanks for being in. And thanks for noticing that, Ed, and bringing that forward. Again, um, now I'd like to introduce you to Brian Harold. Brian Harold is the chair elect. He's the one that will take this position that I have in January. And so um, I'm looking forward to the program that he's brought us. And so Harold, why don't you introduce uh, James and, and we'll move forward. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. So um, tonight we have a real treat. Uh, a man that um, was from my first MKP community in Austin. He's still in, uh, he's in Austin, Texas. Um, and uh, a man who has got quite a background. Um, he's a lawyer, he's a CEO, he's a motivational speaker, um, but most importantly, he is an awesome man. Um, he's a man who almost lost his life at one point. Um, and all these things have brought, uh, brought us to where James is today. So, um, I know that James, I've had the pleasure of listening to him speak in multiple conferences. I know James will bring us a fantastic presentation tonight. 
Um, after the presentation, we're going to have the opportunity to have a breakout session to in a smaller group of probably four to five people in the group. Um, ponder a couple questions that uh, James will leave us with. And then we'll come back after the breakout and have an opportunity to, to share. Uh, and then we'll close out with a section on what's next. So uh, I want to wish you all thanks for showing up. And James, it's time for you to give us your presentation. All right. Well, thank you, Brother Brian. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for having me. Um, it's a real honor to be an MKP brother speaking before you all today. And wow, we've just uh, been through so much over the past 12 weeks. Uh, so many things with respect to our constructed lives and how we showed up at work and uh, raised our children and met with our spouses and traveled about the world uh, have been deconstructed. And we're working on reconstructing our lives right now. And it's uh, just so beautiful to be speaking with you today and to be alive during this pivotal moment in our history. Um, my goal tonight is to just radiate in love and to focus on the topic of healing and building together during unpredictable times. I don't have a political message. I don't have a religious message. I have a message of love and how to align and to center with oneself to bring out the highest and best in oneself during these unpredictable times so that we can do work together. Uh, fortunately, the technology goddesses and gods are working with us tonight. I've got several um, technology devices in front of me in case anything goes wrong. And I've got my shirt from Pitt that is wrapped around my body, surrounding me in love, in which men actually put their hands in my body and told me how much they love me and respect me. And I did the same for them. So I'm feeling good tonight, guys. And I'm going to speak from the heart. Um, as a preamble, I have a few asks of you, and uh, we do a good job with this, but tonight with the pressures of all that's going on in the world, I know that this is sacred time for us, and I just ask that you be present and distraction-free as we talk this evening and uh, realize that this is just as much an investment in myself as it is in you. I'm grateful that everyone has their video screen turned on. I see beautiful faces right now. I see uh, people from all around the world, some who I've met and some who I have not met, but I'm looking forward to meeting. But we know that other stuff can wait because these are critical times. Um, I ask that you give me the opportunity to speak. I've got a lot of ground to cover in about 30 minutes before we break out into our breakout groups. And I have a presentation, I have a short video that I'll be sharing with you, but I've got a lot of content and a lot of material that I'd like to share with you uh, based upon some things that I've learned about navigating challenging circumstances and um, dealing with the aftermath of those challenging circumstances. And also I'll share with you some of the mistakes that I've made on my journey of bouncing around from uh, being a kid, leaving the humble foothills of Virginia to be the first in my family to go to college and uh, go to medical school and drop out and go to law school and uh, fail at practicing as a lawyer and to eventually I uh, deal with some circumstances in which I had to piece my life back together. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful, uh, not that they just happened uh, to me, but they happened for me to learn a lesson to be a higher and a better demonstration of myself. So last month was Mental Health Awareness Month. And I imagine that there are a number of folks uh, on here who know what Mental Health Awareness Month is all about. Uh, I was invited to speak before a number of clients about the, the power of mental health, uh, knowing that the mind, the body, and the spirit are connected. And I got to talk about topics like resilience and self-care and sustainability and healing and building. And what good, solid, elevating mental health means to me is, is it's the power to retake control of one's life. It's the freedom to uh, create our own happiness. It's the freedom from ongoing pain and uh, uh, suffering and distress and worry. It's a freedom from not feeling abundant. It's uh, freedom from uh, self-inflicted suffering or being trapped in the murkiness of uh, flashbacks from childhood or experiences that, that cause us to have post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. To me, it's also freedom from chemical dependency and, and overeating, uh, freedom from certain types of physical pain and freedom from uh, self-doubt and low energy. 
it's, it's freedom from judging others and it's freedom to release and let go of any low vibrational energy. For me, back in March, when we first began this journey of quarantine and lockdown, um, my, my husband and I uh, tried to find new ways to navigate this new world in which we were living. And I'll, I got to tell you that the first week, two, a couple of weeks were rough. Um, but we put together routines and habits and rituals in which we started to get along really well. And we started to show up and be present at work. And we started to get a lot more things done. And we were a lot happier. And we started to just feel better from a mind, body, spirit perspective. And then all of a sudden comes the end of May and early June in which we experienced the protest and uh, people speaking out about their experiences and people speaking back about how they felt other people might feel about those experiences and what America means to them. And so as we begin our chat tonight, I just ask you, how are, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? There is no judgment around whatever feeling pops into your mind right now. You might be feeling anxious or happy or sad or mad or glad or worried. You might have financial worries. Uh, you might have worries about your job or your children or your um, uh, ability to take a vacation or to have something to look forward to. But I just ask for us to pause for a second for me to ask, how are you feeling? Now that we've done that, um, I want to share a little bit more about my professional background. I had the privilege of, of being adopted by this really cool guy in undergrad at the University of Virginia. His name was Dr. Robert S. Brown. And he was an MD as well as a PhD. And Dr. Brown was a forensic psychiatrist. And today he's 88 years old. And he told me, he said, well, James, if you master some of these concepts around mental health and neuroscience, if you become a student of these things, you can take these concepts with you for the rest of your life. You can help other people. You can teach them. You can be a, a great demonstration of light and love and peacefulness and joy yourself. And you can have incredible power. So I'm going to ground our talk tonight in um, some of my training in neuroscience. I've been a student of uh, mental health and neuroscience for over 20 years. And Dr. Brown is still in contact with me today. And uh, he still calls me uh, son and I still call him dad. And I'm so grateful that he spotted me at the University of Virginia to say, you're going to be my teaching assistant. You're going to lead this class of 200 plus students, and you're going to be in charge of 15 to 20 teaching assistants every single semester, and you're going to learn everything that I know, and I'm going to share it with you. And to this day, he and I still have phone calls. We still have check-ins, and I'm still learning. And one thing that I know about the brain is that the brain is massive, and we're still learning about the brain. And if anybody ever tells you that they know everything there is to know about the brain, that person is not telling the truth because we're still making discoveries every single day about the brain. What we are learning is that a lot of the concepts that we've learned outside of the workplace from a psychology perspective are things that are just now being incorporated into healthy workplaces and into healthy organizations like MKP. For example, back in the 80s and 90s, the construct was work hard, play hard. You, when you're in this office or when you're in this factory, you work hard and you don't bring your personal life in here. And we're not worried about the mind, body, or the spirit of the individual. And if you talk about certain things within certain organizations or within certain uh, companies or businesses that you work in, you might be considered weak or odd or different. Now in 2020, we know that the healthiest organizations and the most powerful organizations are those that are willing to accept the power of what we've learned in psychology and in neuroscience and in mental health about how to create healthy environments. Now, with all the, the, the stuff that has been going on worldwide, globally, um, there's an energetic frequency that causes unrest in each of us. We're not separated by time or space right now. We're in a Zoom meeting, and even though you might be in a different city or a different state or even a different country right now, there's no separation between us so long as we look eye to eye and we share that energy. That's the power of understanding metaphysics and how mental health and all this stuff works. And it might sound a little bit confusing at first, but I'm going to go through layer by layer, step by step, some things that we can incorporate into our lives to make our family lives easier, to make our work lives easier, and to help us to come together a little bit better and a little bit stronger throughout this all. Because as individuals are going through something, we take that energy into the organization, into wherever we are, 
And we sometimes battle, we sometimes talk back, we sometimes don't understand another, another person's perspective, and sometimes we might not arrive at the highest level of consciousness that we can. So with all that being said, I believe in hope, I believe in love, I believe in energy, I believe in you, I believe in MKP, I believe that relationships are energy, I believe that communication is energy, I believe that, that, that love is energy. And uh, right now, before I go to my presentation, I would like for us to just do a little uh, energy icebreaker because it's something that I need. And my um, uh, feeling or my best guess is that some others in here might need it as well. So here we go, guys. What I'd like for you to do is to bring your hands together so that everybody can see them. And what we're going to do is we're going to count down from 10 all the way to zero while we're rubbing our hands. And then when we get to zero, we're going to send energy out to everybody else around the world, the first responders, the uh, good police officers, the good neighbors, the good black folks, white folks, transgender, gay, straight, of all stripes, of all religions. We're going to send out love to all of them, and then we're going to bring it on back in. And we're going to feel that vibration, and we're going to feel that love. So you guys ready? All right. So here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, rub them harder. Four, feel that energy. Three, two, one, zero. Spread it out to the world. Oof. Mm, I feel it right now. Now bring it on back in and bring some of that energy and love to yourself and to your family and to your role within this organization and to whatever work that you do in your community and in your business affairs. Um, I really needed that. I really needed that. Thank you all so much. So I've got two stories that I would like to share with you that were foundational pivot moments for me in my development. And I'm so grateful for them. And um, one began in 1999 during Christmas break when I was a student in college. I was a, a good kid dressed in a blazer, uh, kind of a nerd and double majoring at the University of Virginia. And I was on Christmas break and I took my mom shopping at Walmart. And the store was relatively empty and we were just having a good time and laughing in the store. Unfortunately, during that time, I was in the store with my mom. There were a couple of kids in the parking lot who attacked a woman, who mugged her and who beat her. And those kids happened to be uh, young men of color. The police did not catch the men that night, the young men that night, but they did a sweep of the area. And um, I was the youngest, uh, darkest skinned person they could find. And um, at the age of 19 years old, I was apprehended uh, in front of my mother. I was a good kid who was doing all the right things. I had grown up in Lynchburg, Virginia, and um, my dad was a truck driver. My mom was a factory worker. And I would pray, dear Lord, please take me far, far away from here. And I buried myself in the books and I buried myself in leadership positions. And I did all I could to be perfect. And I, Went through high school making straight A's and graduated near the top of my class. Went off to college, busted my butt. Dressed like a total geek. Talked like a geek. But I was apprehended in front of my mom as a good kid. And it was because of nothing that I did. And the recent events of June opened up a wound that I thought had healed. I thought I had dealt with the pain and the trauma of being mistreated in public by the police. I thought I had dealt with the embarrassment of being humiliated in front of my mom and having her screaming and her telling the police to take their hands off of me. I thought that I had dealt with the baggage that I had carried along with me for 20 plus years of having fear of certain police officers. And in fact, I had gone on to serve when I was in the city of Dallas as a public official on the Citizens Police Review Board, working hand in hand with some of the really wonderful 
men and women who serve in law for enforcement. And so as I saw certain things happening on the television and certain events unfolding in cities across the United States, those flashbacks came back to me and I realized that I had some more work to do. And that even though with the degrees and qualifications and certifications and the freedom that I have today as a middle class or above American and the privilege that I have as a man who's no longer a teenager, I thought that I had worked through it. And so for the past two or three weeks, I've cried more than I've cried in the past 10 years. And so from a psychic experience, know that I see you, I honor you. I know that you may have gone through a thing or two in your life too, regardless of your background or the color of your skin. But I know that we're in this meeting as brothers and sisters, united in love. And while we might not move rocks with each conversation, it's that tiny movement that matters. It's that tiny movement that we remind ourselves, in you I see me, in myself I see you, and I'm grateful to be here. Fast forward about a decade later into 2012, I've moved on from being 19 to 31, completed law school, uh, moved on from practicing at a corporate law firm in Dallas, Texas, and I've started my own company. And all of the shadows that I carried of not being enough as a child, growing up in a home in which my father was an alcoholic and uh, really focused on uh, just his own personal freedom at the stake of the family, I carried the shadow of wanting to overachieve, overdo, overachieve, make as much money as I could, and to surround myself with flashy friends. On August 25th, 2012, my best friend Tyler Cook and I and Tyler's in this meeting right now, and he's also an MKP man. We went to my lake house in East Texas, and with all my arrogance, after a week of being tired from work and tired of life and actually quite purposeless in my life, other than to make as much money as I could and to get as much recognition as I could, we decided to take my kayaks out into the middle of this giant East Texas lake. You know, Tyler's a, a physician and we're in our young, early 30s, and, you know, we thought that we were just invincible. So we hopped into the kayaks, no life jackets, no nothing. We just paddled on out to the middle of the lake, and a freak storm came out of nowhere. And that storm turned the lake into a washing machine, and my kayak filled with water. And I tried to rescue, pull my kayak out from the water, but it exhausted me, and I ended up actually inhaling dirty lake water. Uh, Tyler's kayak actually uh, eventually sank as well because the storm was that bad and I had actually splashed water into his kayak trying to save myself. And Tyler made the decision to swim to shore to try to save both of us. But I don't know the distance that he swam, but it was far. But by the time he got to shore, I had begun to drown. And the man who's in this meeting with us this evening is someone who said, to those on shore, we're going to find my friend. We're not going to find him dead. We're going to find my friend. Tyler led the search and rescue mission to find me that night, and they found my body. And my body was, my lungs were filled with water. And um, it was him, a neighbor, and a neighbor's son on a jet ski. But one of the most wonderful things happened to me, and that was I had a transition a spiritual experience in which I consider it to be quite ineffable. I can't put words around it. And I, I still have a hard time explaining it. But I was rescued. I was brought to shore. The paramedics took me th to the hospital. And I subsequently healed and did work two years later on healing from a traumatic brain injury and from the psychic shock of that experience. During that time, I reevaluated my relationships. I reevaluated trauma. I reevaluated what I wanted out of life. And how I saw finances and my purpose. And I realized, yes, I do want to be here. After going through two years of asking myself, I'm not sure I want to be here. I had such a powerful experience and it was so great. I've got to come back here to deal with finances and taxes and relationships and a marriage that wasn't working at the time and so on and so forth. And one day things began to awaken. And about a year after that, I had a wonderful conversation that began as a business meeting 
with incoming chair Brian Harold. And I asked Brian, I said, well, Brian, what's that on your signature block that says the Mankind Project? And Brian kind of had a little twinkle in his eye about the Mankind Project, <laughs> but it was perfect timing. It was perfect timing because I needed the Mankind Project at that time. And I will need the Mankind Project for the rest of my life. And I hope to share my gifts as much as I can with the beautiful faces and souls of the Mankind Project. So I did my weekend and I did the work and an opening happened within me that was just so powerful and so joyous that I uh, uh, began my business practice as an executive coach. I wrote a book that's been sold in six different countries that talk about the power of that healing that I went through. And I've encouraged others to not make the same mistakes that I've made. And all that being said is all this happened not to me, it happened for me. I am excited about the direction that we're going in. I believe that this is a great period of awakening and powerful conversations and in-depth soul searching for our nation, for the world and for MKP. And I'm going to, with that, move into my presentation. All right, Lao Tzu has one of my favorite poems. If there is to be peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. If there is to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. If there is to be peace in the cities, there must be peace between neighbors. If there is to be peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. If there is to be peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. That's from Lao Tzu, the author of the Tao Te Ching and the founder of Taoism. You'll see rule number one, which is the uh, rule that begins my book with first love yourself and, you, and the universe will conspire to lift you higher. We can talk all day long as a group about what we want to achieve and how we want to pivot and to elevate ourselves. But unless we align and center ourselves with love, peace, harmony, truth, acceptance, all those things, we can't do work collectively. I posted a meme about a year ago, and it was after I had the opportunity to speak at a conference regarding healing and developing and finding your best self, kind of like what we're doing today. And it said, the best gift that you can give to any relationship is to first focus on your own self-development. This is true for any boss employee relationship. This is true for any marriage. Instead of us pointing the finger at someone else or uh, saying you should do this or you should do that or um, my way or the highway or my belief system is better than your belief system, what we've got to do is take the time to breathe, to close our eyes, to unpack the issues that we're dealing with and to go within so that we can center ourselves. And as we center ourselves, we become the best and highest demonstration of ourselves. So instead of projecting out into the world something that we want other people to change about themselves, we can do the work within, become this beautiful, elegant, elevated consciousness, and other people can see that, and it's contagious, and they pick up on it. And that's a superpower that each of us can have. And I'm going to talk about how to, how to tap into that superpower for our own personal healing, as well as the healing of any organization this evening. Von Gotha said, it's my personal approach that creates the climate. It's my attitude that makes the weather. I possess tremendous power to make life miserable or joyous. That's you. That's me. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. So as we develop as an organization, as we enhance our approach and elevate our consciousness as leaders in this world, we know that we've got a choice that we can be instruments of torture and humiliation and hurting others because people who are hurting hurt other people. Just like my father is an alcoholic and as someone who uh, took his frustrations out on on his children and his wife by physically beating them did. And I could have taken that with me. But my accident allowed me the conscious choice to pivot in life, to know that I can be a tool of inspiration and that I can help other people. Dr. David Hawkins presented something quite amazing. And this is a man who was not only a physician, but a metaphysician with an MD as well as a PhD. And this map of consciousness allows us to check in with ourselves on an even more granular level. So sometimes we're operating in the orange zone or the yellow zone, or sometimes we're operating in the red zone. The entire purpose of life is for us to spiritually develop and to spiritually awaken. And as we do so, we can identify, Hawkins said, 
where we are today on the map of consciousness on the scale, and we can do work to increase where we are on the scale. He said that at that dotted line, that's the difference between accepting the truth and not accepting the truth. Accepting the truth about ourselves, about our shortcomings, some of the subconscious unpackaging that we need to do, some of the work that we need to do on ourselves. And then once we accept that truth, we can move into a higher calibration um, into levels of trust and optimism and forgiveness all the way up to serenity and bliss. Now, my personal goal is to remain in that light blue to dark blue space in life from that 400 to 600, where it's just this amazing expression of love and kindness and care and acceptance and joy and not trying to change other people's truths, but to accept my own truths. And as I do so, I can bring a different energy to organizations such as MKP or to my business affairs. Hawkins told us something else about this. He said, note that if you're in the green zone or the blue zone, and you're several levels away from someone else who might be in the yellow zone or orange zone, if you try to communicate with that person and say that one plus one equals two, and that person's on a significantly lower level on the scale than you are, that person's not going to hear a word you said. It's going to be meaningless communication. It's going to be ineffective communication. So as leaders, as men of MKP, and as, as women who are, are visiting uh, this channel today, we know that we can check in with ourselves on a granular level. We can say, well, today or this week, I feel like I'm at a 250. But by next week, by golly, I want to be at a 400. Hawkins noted that as we elevate in consciousness, when the higher we go up on the scale, the better things happen to us in life. He called this the law of attraction, where when I put positive thoughts into the world, when I show up as the highest and best version of myself, that job promotion presents itself to me. I have to, uh, I operate more in a state of flow and love and sympathy, and I don't have to operate by force. I don't have to raise my voice to demonstrate this power that is within me. I don't have to force other people to do things that they don't want to do. I show up with this power of strength and courage and this voice of just love. And things happen for me in a magical way. We could honestly spend, spend uh, several hours on Hawkins' map of consci consciousness. He's got several books, and I encourage you guys to check it out if you're wanting to do any consciousness work. But the healing and building can begin within so long as we're willing to admit our truths, so long as we're willing to check in with ourselves and to say, hey, I might be here, but I want to go there. We can do that by incorporating best practices into our lives. And one of the things that is the most powerful during times of stress and trauma that I've learned, and this is after coming back from 825.12 at the age of 31, is that we can connect with the breath. Now, we might not be able to control how well our kidneys are working throughout the day or our liver. We can control them to some degree by our diet and by what we drink and by how much we exercise. But one of the most powerful things that we can control is our breath, is our breath. And the reason why I began with a breath-based exercise at the beginning of this presentation was because the breath allows us to calibrate and to center in such a way that we control the oxygen intake to the body so we're feeding those organs. And we're also controlling our emotional well-being, our stability, our consciousness, and how we feel. As we take deep breaths, we notice that the body begins to relax. The muscles begin to unravel and unkink and we enter into a more relaxed state. And I encourage people that when they're going through times of distress or trauma to find some way somehow to have a schedule of going into meditation, and I know it's hard in the beginning, or into prayer, uh, several times a day on a scheduled basis, whether it's waking up in the morning, or some people do it at 11, 11 and st uh, set their uh, alarm clock for 11, 11, 11 a.m. every single day or uh, some people do it during their noon lunch hour, and some people do it uh, when they have a quiet time by themselves in their, uh, in their uh, chair in the corner of their home in the evening hours. So with breathing, we can uh, uh, control so much, and that light within us begins to wake up. What I'd like to do is because we've gone through so much over the past several weeks is something called tiger breath. And with tiger breath, we... Inhale a positive thought and we exhale ha, a negative thought. And what I'd like for us to do is to take that deep breath of positivity in together. And you're going to feel this, guys. We're going to do it four times. And then we're going to exhale any negative thought that we might have about ourselves, the world. And we're just going to let that go. Let it go. One of the things that I have inhaled 
over the past couple of weeks is peace. Exhale out whatever that negative thing is, and that is uh, suffering. Suffering was my word. So I inhale peace, exhale out suffering. Your word might be love, and your exhale word might be something else. But we're going to do it together, guys. So right now, we're going to take a deep breath. Inhale positivity. Tiger breath out. Exhale negativity. (sighs) Inhale positivity. Exhale negativity. (sighs) Inhale positivity. Exhale out negativity. (sighs) Inhale positivity. Exhale out negativity. (sighs) That just gave me so much energy, so much just awakeness right now that I can't even explain it to you. And it probably gave you a little energy boost as we continued through this presentation. Another uh, rule that I shared in my book was uh, rule number 13. Realize that any way that you see yourself has been self-created. A friend of mine showed me a tattoo of a person who had Um, on her arm, when she extended it, it said, I'm fine when the rest of the world was looking at it. But what she was looking at said, save me. Think about the people who you meet, who we say, hi, how are you? How are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Or have a good day. And there's a lot more going on within. The power of MKP is that we can check in with one another and we don't have to project to the world that we are fine. And if there's an instance in which we need to rally other people to help save us from ourselves and our thoughts, we can do work together. Brene Brown reminds us that we should talk to ourselves like we would talk to someone we love. The majority of thoughts, 80%, some uh, psychiatrists uh, uh, say, are, are negative thoughts that just ruminate in our head, and those thoughts are generally about ourselves. We're also told that even though we might have negative thoughts, Most of the time, the outcomes are neutral or the outcomes are positive, even though we might have a negative thought about a situation. So as we do that work to navigate uh, experiences that might be traumatic or stressful, such as quarantine or uh, such as um, some of the rallies and protests that are going on that we might not fully understand because our experience might be different, let us talk to ourselves with a positive light and a positive voice. Another thing that we can do is we can incorporate daily habits into our lives. We can check in at the end, of the end of the day or the beginning of the day regarding how we're doing. And I'll share this daily habit scorecard with you where we can just sit down in the morning in meditation or in the evening at the end of the day. And we can ask ourselves questions regarding clarity, productivity, energy, influence, necessity, courage, and communication. I think one of the areas in which we can really focus right now are influence and communication. How well am I communicating with my neighbors, my friends, my loved ones, people who I'm reaching out to, knowing that not only am I responsible for the words that I say, but I'm also responsible for how they are received. Because we could spend a lot more time on this, I'll make sure that I get this sent out to you all uh, if you want it, and you can use it, incorporate it into your daily lives. Try it for 30 days, and if you're scoring yourself low as a one, two, or three, try to get yourself to a four or five, and that is by consciously, consciously working on your behaviors regarding your energy, communication, courage, influence, productivity, and so on. And so at the end of coronavirus, at the end of quarantine, when this summer is over, when 2020 is over, we can say, wow, I really, really made a positive difference with myself. And I'm coming out better on the back end. And we can look at those scorecards and say, I might've had a one, 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 or a bunch of twos here, but I'm coming out of 2020 with fours and fives. And that's something that we can do for ourselves. I want to share a quick video with you guys. And that talks about uh, uh, General Admiral McRaven uh, talked at the University of Texas about the power of incorporating daily habits into our lives. It's easy to get thrown off kilter during times of stress. It's also easy to let words slip and for others, for us to project our feelings upon others or for us to not uh, measure our words as well as we should. Admiral McRaven reminds us of the power of doing the simple things like starting our day by making our bed. The Daily Habits Scorecard reminds us to check in with ourselves and to know that we can do even better. 
the map of consciousness tells us to check in and say, this is where I am, this is my truth, and this is where I want to be. But McRaven reminds us to do one little thing in the morning to set our day off um, on the right path. And so I'm going to unshare this screen and I'm going to go into a video, so bear with me very quickly. Change the world, start off by making your bed. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride and it will encourage you to do another task and another and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made. That you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. To pass SEAL training, there are a series of long swims that must be completed. One is the night swim. Before the swim, the instructors joyfully brief the students on all the species of sharks that inhabit the waters off San Clemente. They assure you, however, that no student has ever been eaten by a shark, at least not that they can remember. But you are also taught that if a shark begins to circle your position, stand your ground. Do not swim away. Do not act afraid. And if a shark, hungry for a midnight snack, darts towards you, then summons up all your strength and punch him in the snout, and he will turn and swim away. There are a lot of sharks in the world. If you hope to complete the swim, you will have to deal with them. So if you want to change the world, don't back down from the sharks. Over a few weeks of difficult training, my SEAL class, which started with 150 men, was down to just 42. There were now six boat crews of seven men each. I was in the boat with the tall guys, but the best boat crew we had was made up of the little guys, the munchkin crew, we called them. No one was over five foot five. The munchkin boat crew had one American Indian, one African American, one Polish American, one Greek American, one Italian American, and two tough kids from the Midwest. They out paddled, out ran, and out swam all the other boat crews. The big men in the other boat crews would always make good natured fun of the tiny little flippers the munchkins put on their tiny little feet prior to every swim. But somehow these little guys from every corner of the nation and the world always had the last laugh, swimming faster than everyone and reaching the shore long before the rest of us. SEAL training was a great equalizer. Nothing mattered but your will to succeed, not your color, not your ethnic background, not your education, not your social status. If you want to change the world, measure a person by the size of their heart, not by the size of their flippers. I love that piece. And I see us as munchkins. I see us as, as those who are doing the work today and uh, coming together. And other folks out there, they might be laughing at us and saying, hey, we're not moving the needle with respect to everything that's going on in the world right now, but we're coming together in love just like the munchkins. Um, I want to share with you some free resources that you can go to just to stay uplifted and to stay positive uh, during this time of unpredictability in the world. All these are just totally free resources that I go to. I subscribe to some of their listservs. I get those positive emails and some will send a texting service and send you positive text messages throughout the day. But this will be going out as well. So if you didn't have a chance to write these down, I'll be sharing this information in the recording. And... Finally, um, I'll go to rule number 14, and that is replace negative thoughts with radically positive affirmations. I took a picture when I was stuck in traffic going from Paso Robles, California to LAX, about to fly back to Hawaii last year, and I had a, a speech that I had to give, and I had an executive coaching session to work with um, at PepsiCo with their executives. And I was stuck in traffic, and I was about to miss my plane at LAX. And I was just heated because LA traffic is a beast sometimes. I couldn't navigate around it. And so I'm sitting there stuck in traffic, and I saw these power words painted onto the side of this building. Confidence, gratitude, united, joy, passion, uh, uh, risk, committed, uh, freedom, all those things. And it just reminded me, James, center yourself. Center yourself and go back to your I am affirmation. 
Now, an I am affirmation is what you repeat to yourself again and again. Remember that we said earlier that most of the thoughts in our head are about ourselves. And a lot of the time, those thoughts are negative. And I went to my I am affirmation of I am peace. I am peace. And as I began repeating that to myself in the car, my um, energy changed. My breath changed. I was no longer freaking out, but I had this confidence in me that I was going to get the rental car back and I was going to make it to my plane and I wasn't going to miss that one flight that night back to Hawaii and that everything was going to be okay. And so as we continue to venture through the next several weeks, several months, possibly the next up to the next year in a new normal, I'd like for you to ask yourself, what is your I am affirmation? And that is, or they are, the words that you repeat to yourself in your mind again and again and again about who you are, about who you are. And we get to our I am affirmation by identifying that which is most vulnerable in ourselves at this state in time and what we want to pivot to. And I'll give you an example. My entire childhood, I grew up thinking that we were poor. And part of my work that I had to do as an adult was that I was going to live in an ab in abundance, that I would never run out of food, and that everything would be okay, that I was enough, and that um, I could experience abundance without cheating someone, hurting someone, taking from someone, or without having to work 60 hours plus a week. And so I used to tell myself, well, I'm broke, I'm poor, I'm never going to have enough. But I spent over a year telling myself, I am abundance. And I was in the office when I, when I would, would be in the office and I'd walk to the restroom, I'd tell myself, I am abundance, I'm abundance, I'm abundance, I'm abundance. And I would do subconscious reprogramming on myself. And eventually, all the weeds of negativity in my mind regarding poverty and poor uh, status in life and not having enough, they began to, to die away. And I had these flowers around abundance and what I could achieve in life. And so what we're going to do as part of our exercise this evening in breakout groups, groups is we're going to come up with our I am affirmation. But before we do so, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, which are going to help us to get grounded in your easily coming up with where you are right now so that you can come up with that I am affirmation that's going to serve you through the storm, that's going to help you to heal and build individually so that collectively we can be our best because we see you as the highest and best demonstration of yourself. And some of those questions are, how am I honestly feeling right now? What do I need? When was the last time somebody asked you what you need during the storm? During the last month, was I able to hold space for myself? We're told in organizations, we got to do this better and companies have to be run better. We can re recite mission statements for companies and we can hold space and sit in meetings and do all kinds of work for everybody else all day long. But were you able to hold space for yourself, taking that sacred time out to invest in yourself for a better future so that you could be more centered, more peaceful, more loving, more joyous, and come out better through the storm? And identifying too, what was most challenging for me in the last month and you know, what did I learn? Um, and what can I work, where can I work on changing this month? What can I do to improve conversations within my own household and within my community? And I imagine as you all are leaders in this conversation today, in this meeting today, that you might've had an, an awkward conversation or two, whether it was within the household or uh, within a community or organization that you serve. Might've been a difficult conversation. How can we have navigated that conversation better? How could we have been more responsible for our words how could we have listened better? How could we have chosen our words more deliberately so that we're more responsible for outcomes of acceptance and honoring people's space and their life experiences and how they communicate about where they've been and where they're going? And then how can I better educate myself on things that I don't understand? Those are just some of our grounding questions to consider as we go into breakout, breakout groups. So I believe that... Um, uh, Soronto will be breaking us out into breakout groups. We've got about 10 minutes to ask ourselves the question, what's that thing that I'm feeling most vulnerable about during this unpredictable time? This is your chance to get honest about it. And then when you find that thing that you're feeling most vulnerable about, 
you're going to write down the opposite of it, which is going to be your I am affirmation, which you'll take with you through the rest of this cycle of change and unpredictability in the world. So identify that which is most vulnerable. The opposite of that is what your I am affirmation is. And you'll use that for healing and building, building yourself so that we can come together better as an organization and uh, as a community throughout 2020. So uh, I hope you all found the breakout sessions enlightening. Um, if there's one or two men that have something to share, uh, that's great. We are running a little bit over time. Uh, so just one or two, and then we'll move on to the next part of the program. Well, Brian, I'd, I'd just like to say sharing vulnerability uh, during a time of such challenge and transition was uh, just healing for me. And to come up with that I am affirmation that I'll be using over the next few months until I feel that vibrational change within me uh, was, was really uh, just good for me this evening. And so I thank the, the men in my group, uh, Bob and Alan and uh, Tyler for hearing me out. It was a real pleasure. Just this, the phone started to ring. Whoops. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, my wife will get it. <laughs> um, as you began, as you began, James, I said to myself, oh, this is an inspirational video conference or Zoom call. I, I, I want to say you've touched my heart in a place beneath inspiration, not techniques, not, not poems, not slogans, but uh, some place in me that uh, can heal and uh, be awake and uh, innocent. So thank you. Thank you. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Great, great final comment, Vern. Thank you for that. Uh, and thank you, James, for a really great job. I uh, think I speak for all of us when I say that, you know, people got a lot out of it. Let's honor James. Just to let you know, before we close, to let you know what's coming up next. Next Monday, the 22nd, uh, is the next in our series of racial justice forums. We're going to have, and this is a this is really exciting to me as a theater person. Uh, James Scruggs is a multi award winning writer, performer, producer, teacher, arts administrator. Has been performed, has had his work performed in New York and in Hollywood. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm having trouble talking. And um, his play Three Fifths was one of four New York Times must see productions this past May, or May 2017. And he's going to be our guest on that call. And he is going to actually, um, he has an interactive performance that he does. I'm not going to tell you much about it. Uh, it's very unusual and it's very to the point for the, the next in our racial justice series. Uh, the next in the front porch, chairs front porch series, um, which this is tonight, uh, is going to be on July 7th. And we're going to have uh, Will Keepin and Cynthia Bricks from Gender Equity and Reconciliation International, Jerry, which is a partner organization to, with MKP. We've co sponsored ge healing gender experiences, including events at the UN in Manhattan this past winter. And Will and Cynthia are the founders of Jerry. Been around, the program's been around for 35 years and they'll be sharing with us about that programming and vision at our next Chairs Front Porch. So Paul, uh, anything for you or do you want me to just wrap it up? Yeah, I'd like to say a couple things and thanks Ed and thanks Brian um, and Special thanks, as it's already done, but I'll do it again to James for the gift, James, that you brought us tonight. Um, it was really, really helpful and meaningful to me. And um, I uh, am uh, loved and I am enough. And that's what I'm taking forward. So thank you for that gift. Um, I just want to let everybody know um, that I see the size of your hearts. I see them. MKP is strong and vital and moving forward in new and bigger and better ways. On the other side of what's happening, 
we're going to be bigger, stronger, and more alive and making a bigger difference in the world. And that's because of the size of your hearts. You make a difference. You make a difference in my lives, make a difference in your neighbor's lives, in your family's life, in your community's life, and in the world. Thank you for making that difference. My life, my life would not be the same without you in it, in these calls. We're gonna to continue to bring programs forward so that we can stay connected, so that we can see the goodness that we are and move forward in ways to grow together. So thank you for coming. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week and the weeks to follow. And keep being who you are and keep sharing what you learned in your circle this evening with yourself so we can strengthen ourselves and move ourselves forward. Good evening and thanks again.